Greetings, friends. My name is Don Springer, and I'm coming to you this morning from near Toronto, Canada. I was going to attempt a, a greeting in French, as I am Canadian, uh, but it was a spectacular failure. And so, please forgive me, I'm going to have to stick to English. Please know that I am deeply grieved to not be with you. I was very much looking forward to this conference, and I want to thank Marie and all of the other organizers for what seems like an amazing conference. So thank you. I look forward to hopefully meeting you all soon. The following presentation is an effort to summarize briefly my primary area of interest with St. Irenaeus. I am particularly fascinated with early Christian teachings on the practical or spiritual elements of the Christian life. In my recently completed dissertation, I examined Irenaeus's theological reflections on the spiritual life. My interest was to examine his utilization of Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and the Imago Dei this idea that humanity has in some way been created in the image and likeness of God. Much has been written on the topic, of course, and good work has been done exploring this ancient writer's anthropological insights. Several scholars, Fantino and Orbe, notable among them, have succeeded in effectively examining the image and likeness in humanity by way of offering a systematic and thematic approach to Irenaeus's use of and understanding of Genesis 126. My interest was to take a more diachronic approach to Against Heresies. My dissertation examined 10 larger multi-chapter text units within which the reference to the divine image and likeness plays a prominent part. The purpose was to identify the primary context to which these allusions to the Imago Dei belong. In so doing, I observed a clear pattern. My thesis argues that Irenaeus is not utilizing Genesis 126 primarily for its anthropological insights. Moreover, his principal aim is not to explore what the terms image or likeness mean or what these keywords tell us about the human constitution. Rather, I argue that Irenaeus references the Imago Dei primarily as a motif through which to articulate the intended relationship between God and humanity. This morning I cannot work through all ten of the text units that I studied, of course, but I will briefly highlight one of them, that found in Against Heresies 5, chapters 15 and 16. To begin, I will make a few introductory remarks about this section as a whole and the two key texts within it. At first glance, these two chapters seem well suited to actually contradict my thesis. Chapter 15 in particular is noted for its significant emphasis on God's formation of man a formation expressed in such a way so as to oppose the Valentinian creation scheme. This heretical position was noted, of course, for its anti-material and rather ethereal emphasis. Thus, Irenaeus affirms the Genesis narrative that the Creator truly took clay of the earth and fashioned that first man, saying in Genesis 126, God saying, let us make man after our image and likeness. There is no doubt that these statements address anthropological issues. 
They are, after all, discussing the constitutional forming of the first human. Much could be said, much the same could be said, rather, about a second reference to the Imago Dei in this section that I'm going to be looking at. This one occurs just one paragraph after the first, here in chapter 16, paragraph 1. And it too is loaded with the language of formation and also with the idea of the substance used by God to shape and form Adam. But whereas the first text looked back at man's creation, this one looks ahead, stating that the hand of God, quote, forms and prepares us for life, being present with the handiwork and perfecting it after the image and likeness of God. So at the end of chapter 15 and the start of 16, you have two separate allusions to the Imago Dei. The first points to creation, the second both to the beginning and completion of humanity's journey. A careful reading of the larger context will reveal, as I have already stated, a theological concern that goes beyond a narrow, strictly anthropological reading. I will demonstrate the larger context by looking at these two chapters and noting three main sections within them. The first draws from Old Testament prophecy, the second emphasizes the divine economy, and the third fixates on the achievement of Christ's work. Each of them contributes to and illustrates what I argue is this larger purpose or context of this unit of text. We will begin with chapter 15. The chapters leading into Heresies 515 are noted for the repeated emphasis on the flesh on the belief specifically that there is a quality and a goodness to the flesh, both as it concerns the incarnate word and to humanity at large. As was often the case, Irenaeus begins chapter 15 by drawing a connection between the goodness of the flesh with humanity's initial creation. The paragraph will pivot, however, as he frames the discussion in an eschatological context and employs prophetic texts to emphasize humanity's restoration. And so Irenaeus writes, quote, He who at the beginning created man, he promised him also a second birth. Isaiah thus declares, The dead will arise again, and they who are in the tombs will arise. For the dew, which is from God, is health to them. And then, quoting Ezekiel, he adds, The Lord says to these bones, Behold, I will cause the spirit of life to come upon you, and I will lay sinews, and bring flesh, and I will stretch skin upon you, and will put my spirit into you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Irenaeus then brings commentary to this text, saying that as we at once perceive that the Creator is in this passage represented as vivifying our dead bodies and promising resurrection and resuscitation and conferring immortality, he is shown to be the only God who accomplishes these things. And as himself the good father, benevolently conferring life upon those who have not life from themselves. And so we see Isaiah, rather Irenaeus, writing of this second birth, resurrection, of the spirit being poured into lifeless forms to bring resuscitation to bring revivified life. There is also an interesting return here to an illustration that accompanied an earlier allusion to the Imago Dei 
in Heresies 3.17, he references there the dew of Gideon, the, the, the dew of the fleece, as a way to point ahead to the Holy Spirit that would settle or come upon all of humanity. Or, to be more precise, he says also that the dew was needed in order that we, quote, be not burned up. Back in Book 5, he's quoting Isaiah's reference to the dew, associating it with the second birth and with the vivification that comes with renewed health and resuscitation. And so, this eschatological theme is clearly emphasized into what had been a lengthy discussion on the goodness of the flesh. And it is out of that that this leads into these two references to the divine image and likeness. The first of which is found in the second paragraph of chapter 15, and which introduces our second major section, that on the divine economy. Paragraph 2 of chapter 15 transitions from the prophets back to the creation narrative. Here the Imago Dei is not initially used or referenced, but there is an allusion to Genesis 2-7, where God breathes life into the first man. Quote, The Lord most plainly revealed himself and the Father to his disciples, in order that they might not seek after another God besides him who formed man, and who gave him the breath of life. Now, the work of God is the fashioning of man. As mentioned earlier, here Irenaeus pairs the beginning with the end, the formation of humanity with her restoration. The primary concern is on the divine economy, on God's purpose in creation. He states simply that God's work is the fashioning of humanity. Father John Baer argues that the emphasis on the formation of humanity is central to Irenaeus' theology. It is, quote, the basic structure of his thought. It determines his theology at all levels, end quote. As the paragraph continues, Irenaeus expands further on the scope of the work of God. And Jacques Fantino argues that there is a deliberate attempt throughout the chapter to show that humanity's creation and restoration are both parts of the single divine process. This is demonstrated when the narrative of the blind man healed with mud by Jesus, is paired by Irenaeus with the creation narrative. He states that the Lord spat on the ground, made clay, and smeared it on the eyes, thus pointing back to the original fashioning of man, how it was affected, and revealing the hand of God to those who can understand. For that which the artificer, the word, had omitted to form in the womb, here referencing the blind man's eyes, he then supplied in public that the works of God might be demonstrated in him, in order that we might not seek out any other hand by which man was fashioned. He in the last times sought us out who were lost, winning back his own, and with joy restoring us to the fold of life. Fantino's argument is that when Irenaeus refers to this fashioning, he does so to signify the connection between the original modeling of the creation with the spiritual modeling that occurs in Christ. There is there thus a, quote, unity between creation and salvation, end quote. And once more I thought of quoting it in French, but decided the better of it. 
There is a continued emphasis on creation and the formation of humanity through paragraphs 3 and 4 in chapter 15, with further interplay between creation and regeneration. Irenaeus there draws from Jeremiah, Paul, he includes another healing episode from Jesus, as well as invoking some anti-Valentinian uh, polemic by referencing again to Genesis 126. Once more, he's positing the truly material, hands-on creation of man and his sub substance by the one God. But let's jump ahead to chapter 16 and to the final section that I'll cover today. Here we're speaking of the Incarnation and its achievement. In chapter 16, Irenaeus' purpose is clear. With one eye always directed to his task of refuting the heretics, his other eye looks to express the beautiful relationship meant to be shared between humanity and God. Quote, Thus was the hand of God plainly revealed, by which Adam was formed, and we too have been formed, and since there is one and the same Father, whose voice from the beginning to the end is present with his handiwork, we should therefore not seek after any other Father besides him. Though humankind was created long ago, and though there is a regeneration that is desperately needed, the Father, Irenaeus says, has been ever-present to his creation. There is therefore no excuse, no reason to look elsewhere for truth. And it is here in the closing statement of 516 paragraph 1 that Irenaeus brings the discussion to a climax by now truly utilizing the motif of the Imago Dei to its full effect. He states that there is no other substance, no other hand of God, besides that which, quote, from the beginning to the end, forms us and prepares us for life and is present with the handiwork, perfecting it after the image and likeness of God. There are many layers that could be unpacked here, from the polemical concern to the continued unity between creation and restoration and yes, one can explore the anthropological insights present in this notion of a perfected human being. But if there was any doubt as to Irenaeus' primary concern behind his employment of the imago motif, it should be clear here and in the second paragraph of chapter 16. Here again, he speaks of how the word was, quote, assimilating himself to man and man to himself, that by means of his likeness to the Son, his similitude, that man might become precious to the Father. We read here that the Son came uniting humanity to himself, so that through this assimilation, the likeness could be restored through this work of the Son. But Irenaeus does not point firstly to the internal constitutional reality or benefit of to man. Rather, again, the emphasis is on the fact that restored humanity becomes now precious to the Father. The issue is once more on the relationship between creator and created. In the remaining few statements of the second paragraph, we are fortunate to have the Greek text here, which confirms that Irenaeus ended here with a flurry of references to both the image and likeness. Quote, It was said that man was created after the image of God, but it was not yet revealed 
For the word, after whose image man was created, the word remained invisible. And thus was the similitude, the likeness, easily lost. When, however, the word of God became flesh, he confirmed or he established both. For he revealed the image truly, since he himself became what was his image. And he reestablished the similitude after a sure manner by assimilating man to the invisible Father through the means of the visible Word. The emphasis had previously been on how the incarnate Word united himself to humanity, and in this the image was truly revealed. And there is no doubt that the anthropological implications are significant. Yet observe again how the paragraph concludes. He shifts the focus of assimilation. He declares that the similitude is now indeed established in humanity by virtue of the assimilation that now occurs with the Father. The image being restored through the Word's union with humanity and the similitude being secured by the union with the invisible Father. Again, the image and likeness motif from Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is employed, I argue, as a means to describe humanity's restitution with God. Irenaeus's concern is anthropological, but really only in the sense, or at least primarily in the sense, that humanity is meant to find the wholeness of life and being that comes through fellowship with the Father by the Son. Each of these three sections of chapters 15 and 16 of Book 5 of Against Heresies, drawing as they do, firstly from OT prophecy, then emphasizing the divine economy, and then through articulating the achievement of the Incarnation. Each of these contributes to the larger context of this text unit of chapters 15 and 16. And together they demonstrate the greater concern for humanity's union with God. The Imago Dei serves Irenaeus well as a means to explain the manner in which this relationship with the divine is wired into the very fabric of man's being. To be created in the divine image and likeness is, above all else, to be created by God for communion with him. And that, I argue, is Irenaeus's primary concern when referencing Genesis 1.26. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.